So um, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures and I'm trying to get through this. And, and I, please, what, I, what I'm not trying to do is I don't want to pull you into any grief situation, but this is what it is. And you're going to be put in situations where you're going to have to grieve. And I suspect that the reason I'm here today is because some of you are resisting grief. As if, that if, as if, if, if you grieve, you're going to show to people who hate you that you're suffering. But grief is not something that, that, uh, that says that we're weak. What grief really is, is it's humanity. It's a part of who you are. And there's a story in the Bible. You know the, the story of Jacob. The Bible says that God called himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob is the third generation. Whenever God builds something with longevity, he always waits till the third generation to establish it. So God makes promise to Abraham. And in the promise, God said to Abraham, if you leave Mesopotamia and you go to the place I show you, God said, I will make of you a great nation. God, God gave him all these promises. Um, so Abraham trusts God. Abraham is known for his faith, but Isaac, his son, the Bible says, received the promises. That's what he's known for. So Abraham believes God and he moves in faith. Isaac just receives. So it is interesting. Abraham has to move to demonstrate his faith, but God's word to Isaac was to stay in the land and sow. So one moves in faith, the other one stays in the land. But when we get to the third generation, we get to the third generation, and, and we have Jacob. Yes. So, so we have Jacob. I, I think I disturb babies. I, when, we do the, the, uh, <laughs> when we do dedication, it should be fun. So, so, so in the third generation, here we have Jacob, and Jacob is flawed. He's a swindler. He comes out lying and deceiving. But God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And being the God of Jacob is what I identify with because the story of Jacob is, is it's kind of tragic up to a certain point. And here's what I want to speak to today is, I'm going to talk about grief that heals. But I want to, I want to tell you a little bit of his story. So, so you know the story of Jacob. He, he, has, he wrestles with an angel. First of all, he works for Laban. Laban is his uncle. Laban changes his wages 10 times in 20 years. So he works for him for 20 years, and 10 times he swindles him out of his pay. 10 times. Then God speaks to him. God said, leave, go back. Now he's going back home to face his brother Esau, who he ripped off of the birthright. Follow the story? Then from there, he wrestles with, with the angel. Actually, he, the angel of God picks a fight with him. He wrestles with the angel, right? And when that's finished, his thigh is knocked out of joint. I'm, I'm just aggravating babies all over this place today. Uh, he knocks his thigh out of joint, so he's limping across the brook Jabbok. He gets across there, and when everything is settled, Esau forgives him. He thinks everything is good, and then Rachel dies in childbirth, giving birth to his, the second boy. And so he's grieving. Right after that, he, he's grazing Benjamin. He loves Joseph. He makes the coat of many colors. You're, you're tracking with me? He makes the coat of many colors. And the Bible says after this, then his sons come home and says to him, a wild beast has killed Jacob, and they present the coat with the blood. And Jacob says something that I want to read to you, and it's, it's significant. It says this, uh, then Jacob tore his garment and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose to comfort him. But listen to this statement in Genesis chapter 37 and verse 35. It says, but Jacob refused to be comforted. Jacob refused to be comforted. When you look at the word comforted up here, he, re he rejected the grieving process. He cried, and then when he was done, he got to the place where no matter what they said to him, how they tried to coach him along in his grief, he refused to close the book on the situation. And when you refuse to grieve a situation for whatever reason, maybe you don't, you don't want closure, maybe you, you don't want to accept it as being true, or maybe it's too heavy for you, when you do that, it builds and it compounds. Later on, when God is making a way, God sends Joseph, you know the story, he's down in Egypt preparing the way, and the Bible says years later, 17 years later, um, the brothers come down, and they're trying to buy grain because there's a famine. 
And, and, the, and Jake, Joseph recognizes his brothers. They don't recognize him. And so he pulls a deal. He keeps Simeon, the brother Simeon. But he says, go back and bring your brother Benjamin. Remember that story? He takes their money, puts it back in their, back, in their backpacks, and they get home. The money's there. And when, when they tell Jacob the story of how uh, the, the prime minister of Egypt sends for his son, Jacob is again overwhelmed, and he makes another statement. And here's what he says. The Bible says, when they told him the situation, the Bible says, Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. He says, Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you will take Benjamin. And then he made this statement. Here's what he said. All these things are against me. Say the out loud. Say, all these things things are against me. Have you ever felt? in a situation that you're walking through in life, that on a season in your life that everything was against you? Have you ever felt like nothing that you did, it seemed like you, you talk to God, he's not talking back to you. You pray for doors to be opened, they're not opening. Enemies are coming at you without any, any fear of reprisal. They're just doing what they want to do. You, you either lost your job, the money's not right, something, is, and it seemed like God is silent. Jacob makes this statement that everything is against him. Get this. While God was in Egypt Egypt preparing a a land for him, Joseph was there preparing to bring his father down. This was, he was right at the door, at the precipice of this new life that God had for him. But in this moment, it seemed like everything was against him. And it all stems back to this one thing. He refused to grieve. Grief is hard. Grief is hard. One of the most difficult things I found about grief for myself is that when when my brother gave me the news, he says, he says, you know, he says, heart, um, dad coded. I said, okay, and here's my mindset. I've heard stories about dad before. Dad has been through hardship before. But this time, my brother is sober. He says, dad is cold. I said, so, okay, so did they revive him? He's good. He said, well, he's, he's on a ventilator. I said, okay, he'd be okay, right? He got quiet. He said, um, no, not this time. So for me, I knew him as the resilient one. If my father taught me anything, he taught me how to bounce back. My son did an interview for, one of, for, my, for my 50th birthday with my dad, and he asked my dad, he said, what is the one thing about heart that you admire? And you know, my dad said, I, I admire his resilience. Interestingly enough, my son had asked me the same question. What's the one thing you admire about your father? I said, his resilience. And we said the same thing without knowing the story. And my, my son says, it's amazing how you see the same thing in each other. And I said, because I see him as the template. I study him like I study books. He was a lesson to me. And so, so for me, him not being here is going to be different, but, it's, but it means that, watch now, then I become the template. Now, now I'm going to say to you concerning this, and, and it, my heart is heavy, and I didn't come to preach, but I came to share. Is that okay? I, w- I want to share because I think it's important for us to understand a lot of things about grief. Trouble is going to come. It's a part of life. Death is something that's going to happen. You have to understand how grief works. When Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those who have no hope. He says, grief and hope have to go together. Watch this, not just in death, not just, any loss. Grief is not just about dying, it's about losing. You got it? And, and, and it's a, a statement that I want you to understand. Um, you, have, you have suffered the loss of relationship. We have suffered the loss of people, people that we didn't think would ever leave our lives. And they may not have done us all the way right, or they maybe have done us wrong or dirty. And we grieve them and we don't understand. We, we're crying as if we're angry. Can I share something with you? Hatred cannot grieve. Hate, hatred lacks the capacity to grieve. Only love can grieve. Only love can grieve. Because a person does you wrong does not mean you don't love them. Because the relationship ended suddenly, they betrayed you, they, whatever the situation was, it does not mean that you don't love them. It, but they may not love you or they may not have done you right, but it doesn't change. Be careful of thinking that because a person has done you wrong and you automatically can switch gears and hate them. Love is love. And love, when love settles on the issue and sees things for what they are and accepts the fact that this has changed, when, lo- when the heart processes loss, love says, let's fight for it. Grief is really a tug of war between death and love. 
And what's interesting, the Bible says that there's a scripture in the, when Solomon is, is waxing um, um, eloquent in his wisdom. Solomon says this. He says, love is as strong as death. So can you imagine love and death in a stalemate? Pulling against each other, tugging against each other. That's what it is. And your heart is in the middle. And so what you have to do is you've got to settle it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, in those days... Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, he said, you're different people now. He says, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made for them. And he says this, you lived in this world without God, and you lived in this world without hope. Nothing to look forward to. The Greek word elpis means that something has happened in your life, and you're, you're thinking to yourself, this is the end of it. There's nothing left for me. The believer cannot grieve without hope. When you start grieving without hope, Satan isolates you. He backs you into a corner, and he tells you that's the end of you, so you're going to die with me. When you bury whatever you're burying, you're going to bury yourself with it. There are people in this room that stop living when they buried their loved one. And your family member, your mother, your father, your brother, will, will, will be so upset that when you put them in the ground, you went in the ground with them. Because you, did, you don't honor them with your living. I intend to honor I intend to stand. I, I'm not going to tell you I'm, I won't fall apart. And it comes in waves. You don't know when it happens. I mean, I'll be laughing and then I'm crying. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this. I was, I was terrified to come here today because I was telling the Lord, I do not want to be vulnerable in front of these people. And the Lord says, if you're not going to be vulnerable, vulnerable in front of them, then who are you going to be vulnerable in front of? I mean, if, if they can't see your humanity, then who's going to see it? And so I, 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 don't, I stand here in... in, in Weakness and in pain, but I stand here honoring the Lord for what He has given me. My father was not a perfect man. Can I speak to that for a minute? He was flawed. His humanity was so pronounced stubborn, loud, extroverted. He didn't care about a whole lot of other things. He was driven, he knew what he wanted. Um, I, I, some of the stuff that he had, I wanted, I just didn't get it. He stood five foot seven tall, a giant of a man. When he walked into the room, he sucked all the air out because he knew he was that guy. You knew he was in the room. People knew him by one name. They called him Ramsey. That was it. You say Ramsey, and they thought about one person. When I was with him, I, I, I disappeared, and I watched him maneuver and the way he handled things and handled people. The first time my father complimented me, I was in my middle 40s. He said, what? Yeah. The first time he, he complimented me as a, an adult, I was in my middle 40s. He could not, he walked into the church that I started and he said, after we were burying my brother, my father looked around at this place. He said, these people hired you? <laughs> as if to say, they hired you? And so I, I said, no. I said, I started this church in, my, in a bedroom. He said, you started this church? And the guys around me are freaked out. And, and we walked into the, the, the resource center where all my teaching tapes were and dad is reading these things. He goes... He said, he picked up a series and go, do you know what you're talking about? <laughs> so, I, so I turned to the guys with me and I said, um, give him anything he needs, his money doesn't spend here. And I went to my office and I sat there and I, and I, was, I found myself moping. My assistant came in and he says, what's, what's the deal with your dad? And I said, the last time he saw me, I was a drug addict. And he doesn't know what God has done. He said, you never told me. I said, no. He said, does he know you have a PhD? I said, no, nope, he doesn't know. He said, why didn't you tell him? I said, long story. So dad walks into the office with a bag full of tapes. He says, I'm going to listen to these and see if you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> about three days later, he calls me on the phone. He's like, he said, where did you learn this stuff? And I said, what do you mean? He said, this is incredible. I said, what are you listening to? He said, your series on focus. He said, it shifted my thinking. I said, really? I shifted your thinking? He said, no, the teaching. <laughs> he said, the teaching shifted my thinking. <laughs> I was like, you, hard, you don't give compliments, do you? And he, he, he started to preach back to me the things that I said on the tape. And, for, and we started to build this relationship based on not who I was, but who I became. And he was the one that told me, he says, you need to go on television here. And so we got resources and we went nationally in the Virgin Islands. And many lives were saved because my father saw, he says, the people here need to see what I saw. Because he said, I thought 
that my son was gone. What's interesting, though, is that in one of the messages that I was preaching, he called me, he was, I embarrassed him. Because I told the story about how when I was homeless, I called him from a payphone in Miami. And I said, Dad, I, I don't have any money. I'm on the streets of Miami. I'm in the, one of the worst ghettos in Liberty City. Can you send me some money to get, to get me home? And here's what he said. He said, I warned you about the decisions you're making. He said, you've made your bed. Now be a man and live. And I hung the phone up and I was angry. I was hateful in my heart towards him. But when I, as I lived through life and the trajectory that I found myself on, it was that decision that he made that day that he, I found out later on that he cried about. It was that decision that changed my life. And I said, and so me and him on the phone, he was telling me about this. He said, he said, he said, are you sure you remember the conversation? I said, that's what you told me. And here's what he said. He said, I would have never done that. And I said, not in yourself. I said, but the Lord had you to do that. Because I had lessons to learn. And so we talked about, and it, I said to him, I said, do not grieve this. It's the best decision that you ever made concerning me. Because it made me stand up. And I looked back. And I said, did you hear the rest of that message? He said, yes. I said, I was thanking you. Because of the decision you made about me. Sometimes God will have your parents to make decisions about you. Because, and here's why. He, he would have them to kind of cut the cord. Because they've done all they can. And now it's up to you to use what they've given you to become what you're supposed to be. You get it? So what I want to do with this, what I want to do with the rest of this is I want to talk to you just a little bit about grief. I'm going to let you go. Is this helping you any at all? No, don't, don't just say, don't say it's not if it is. Don't say it is if it's not, because I don't want to. And so, I, I, preferably, my siblings are watching. Some of them normally watch me. And my, my, uh, my, my sister was telling me, she said, you know, for the last uh, three years of dad's life, he, he, he was um, actually, his mobility has kind of slowed down. And she said that um, he, the, the church had this uh, CCTV, like a closed circuit thing that they do, and you could watch services from home. And she said, but he never watched them. She said, he always Googled you. She said, so you know, she said, you pastored him for the last three years of his life. And I didn't know that because we didn't talk a lot because of the flow of my life and the flow of his life. And when we did talk, it was, he called me, he never called me by my name. He always called me doctor. And so you always, you, you always say, oh, <laughs> we, we, the last conversation, we were trying to talk him into moving from the islands to Chicago just to be with some family and get some medical help. And so we all were t weighing in, and I said to him, I said, Dad, you, you're at the place now. You need to let us take care of you. And he, he was just that man. He didn't want to. And he says, who's this? I said, it's, it's hard. And he said, oh, oh. He said, what, what do you think? I said it again. And so, so he said, okay. He submitted, he, for the first time in his life, he submitted to us as a, as a, a group of his children, and um, in that moment, I thought to myself, how, if we don't learn the lessons that we're being taught in the days that we're able to learn them, then when it's time to use them, we won't know what to do. And I, I said it by saying this, you know, you go through three stages of life. The first stage is learning. You, you are anointed to learn in the first third of your life. And then the overlapping stage is the earning stage where you're anointed to earn. So you're learning, and then it, it, it kind of triggers over into earning. And then later on, like in the middle of the, of the second season of your life, or second third of your life, you start getting this urge to, to mentor and to give back. And then you, you enter into the returning stage. So it's learning, earning, returning. Say that. Say learning, earning. So, in, so in, the, in the learning stage, you have to be careful that you open yourself up to learn. You cannot walk around the learning stage like you know. If you act like you know in the learning stage, when it comes to the earning stage, you're going to be a low-wage earner. Here's why. You didn't learn enough. Do, you closed your heart in the learning phase. That means it, it, it pushed you down on the ladder of the earning phase. And when it comes time to return, you're still so busy earning that you can't return. You have nothing to give back. And so you see a lot of people, you see a lot of people that get into that third season of life and they have nothing to give back because they, and it's not the second stage, it's the first stage that damaged them. Okay, so let me get, I'm going to give you this real fast. And all of this is just off our life experience. I hope it's not too much for you, but I'll say this. You know, there the are three things that are necessary for learning to occur. Number one, you need an instructor, a teacher that knows what the heck they're talking about. 
You, you just need, you need to find someone. You know, people look at, especially in church, you come and you want the cool pastor. You want the, Listen to me. I am here because you need to learn. The, the, only, the only reason that God can make this connection is because you need to learn. And so I'm in the phase where there's, I want to, I wish I could tear your head open and just pour all this stuff in and some of the stuff drip down into your heart so you could just blow up. My, my desire is for you to, because I understand the need, right? So the, so the learning phase, you need a, t- a teacher that knows what they're talking about. Number two, you need a student that, that's passionate to learn. So I could be up here teaching you, teaching you. If you don't see the value of it, it does you no good. The third thing that you need is a common language between them. You need a teacher that knows what he's talking about, a student that's passionate to learn, and number three, you need a common language. I, can, I speak a language even with an accent that you understand. And then you take this information, right, and you, you use this information, and, and it becomes practical to the place where you begin to earn differently. Not just earn money, earn trust. Earn trust. Earn, earn connections. You, you start earning, watch this, and then when you, when you make a living of this, a life of this, when you get to the returning phase, your heart is compassionate because you remember what you were as a learner and as an as a earner. Is this helping you? I, I learned this from, a lot of this my father said to me, a lot of this I learned from watching him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to offer this and then I'll get to the grief part. A lot of what I learned from my dad, he didn't tell me. He never sat me on his lap to teach me. I learned a lot by watching him. And I'm going to say this to you. Don't be caught judging your parents when you should be observing them. Listen to what I'm saying. He made so many mistakes, but I learned from what he did. Note to self, don't do that. Note to self, note to my father stayed in one place so long, and when he got older, he, 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 to me, he should have been gone. And so when I got to a certain age, and I had the option to stay and dig in, I looked at my dad, and I said, you know what? He didn't do it, and it didn't work out well for him. So I made a decision counter what I saw him make. Why? Because he was the template. God gives, your, your parent is the example that goes before you. When the Bible says, honor your mother and your father that your days may be long, I don't think you understand the word Honor. What it means is you honor every, you watch them, you learn them, you honor their decisions, you honor their successes, you honor their failures. And what do you do with that? You internalize it. Honoring honoring your parents simply means that I I watch what they do and I put it in context. I watch what they didn't do and I said, no to self, I need to, honoring your parents means do not ignore the pattern of their lives. You know why? Because you you are them by DNA. I can't stand my mother. Well, you or her, what you going to do? <laughs> by, de- by, 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 listen, by genetics, by genetics, you can see who you are going to become by watching them and make proper adjustments now. Don't dishonor them. I am grateful that God sent someone ahead of me and I wasn't the one walking through the minefields and making the decisions. I- I'm glad I got a chance to, I- he was my cheat code. Yeah, he was my dictionary, my encyclopedia. And to this day, I stand to honor him, um, and I reframe every, ex- every negative experience I've ever had with him, I reframe it, and I put it in a textbook. And I, and I stand today, maybe a week or so, we're going to do his home going the following weekend, and maybe what, what, when we stand there and every, all the people gather to honor who he was to them, I may sit silently and just remember that this, that what I am and, and the people that I've touched is because of one man that stood five, seven with an accent that you can hardly understand. That was, that was when he was mad, he was fiery, that he, that he could feel that he was the biggest giver. He would give the world away and he was rich for as long as I knew him. Not because someone gave to him, because his father was murdered when he was five years old. And all he knew was work. And so all we knew was work. So this man became to me um, the example of who you should be. I want to give you these before I sit down. Is this helping you? Okay. It's helping me. 
is helping me. The, the, the first thing you need to know about grief is there can, there can be no healing without grief. If you're going through something right now that troubles you, that is distracting to you, that, that you consider a loss, if you don't find a way to start to grieve it, you're not going to heal from it. And so what we do, we'll, we'll be in situations because we were, like Jacob, Jacob, the Bible said he refused to be comforted. He refused to grieve. He rejected the grief process. When it came upon him, he'd make an excuse. And what happens to us, and really it's a, it's a, it's a form of pride. And so we'll, we will reframe a situation to say, well, it's not, it's not as bad as, as it looks, or I, I, I can handle it, or it, it don't faze me. No. And you're lying to yourself. And when you start lying to yourself and you cut off the heart's ability to grieve, you, you actually incarcerate yourself into this situation where ultimately you're going to be overwhelmed. Yeah. You're going to move from, I, I, um, I refuse to be comforted to everything is against me. Because it's going to stack up. And you're going to find yourself responding like a person with PTSD. Responding to things that happened years and years ago because you, you refuse to grieve them. The, the, the outlet that God has given us is grief. When, so, when the heart perceives loss, uh, instinctively, without your permission, it begins to cry. Your heart cries before your eyes do. Have you ever been in a situation where, where you were laughing and you all belly laughing and all of a sudden you start crying? Have you ever seen a person start crying in, in the middle of a joke? You all are laughing and the person starts crying and cannot stop? You know what that is? That's pent up grief. Because regardless of how we, the, we, the show we put on and we, many times we dress it up and, and make it up and, and, and buy it up. We got all this stuff around us and all these people around us and, and we're broken and we're hurting because things happen to us that we never made peace with. So the three, and I think I've shared this with you before, but it bears repeating. There can be no healing without grief. I must grieve these three things. Number one, I must grieve what it was. I must grieve, say it, I must grieve what? Out loud, I must grieve what? I got to grieve what it was, and here's why. And, and when I say what it was, I got to be honest. I can't make it what it was. You know, so what we'll do is we'll say, well, you know, when a person died, we'll go, oh, they were such a great person. We never had any problem. They smile. You ever heard of They smile all the time. It's a lie. Ain't nobody will ever like that. The, the, the reality is when I'm grieving, I got to grieve what it was. It was dysfunctional at times. We went years. My father and I went 10 years one time. They said a word to each other. Yeah. Because I was in the learning phase, he was already coming up on the returning phase. He didn't have time for my foolishness. I didn't have time for his harshness. But he sent for me. He was about to get married. He sent for me. He told my sister, he said, I want heart to stand with me. Be my best man. I'm like, why me? I thought it was a setup. I didn't trust him. There was something was wrong with that. What do you mean? Come stand. The, the, what are you trying to do? So I went, and I, I, I never forgot, I just got out of the military. I stood, I stood with him, and I got a chance to see him up close differently. I got to see him. He was different. He was, he was more reserved. He was, the edges had been smoothed out. He was, he was, uh, there was something about him. There was a dignity about him I, I'd never noticed as a child. As a boy, I saw him as this tornado. Now I'm seeing him as a breeze. He's just kind of blowing and, and things are, are coming to him and I'm, I'm wondering what is, and then I realized as I grew, James, I started to be just like him. And the, the more I realized that, that I was becoming a lot like him, I, I studied him even the more. So it wasn't always perfect. It wasn't even always right. So in this, I have to grieve what it was, what it actually was. Number two, I got to grieve what it meant. What did, what, what, what did it mean that we, is that, what, that God chose him? Why would God choose him to be my father? Why would God choose your father knowing he wouldn't stay? Here's why. Because what God really wanted in the situation may not have been his instruction or even his example, just his DNA. See, what you don't understand is when you study biology and you study, get deep into it, there's a, this, this genetic code called DNA, it's a transferring of giftings, of experiences. There's a lot of things in that DNA. And God actually, he actually cheats and gives you something that, that the person went through. 
So you, you act in a certain way, don't even know how, why you're responding in certain ways. It's because God saw your parents struggle through slavery or whatever they went through. Watch this. He took the DNA, he passes it to you. Now you have the same resilience, but you've never been through it. And sometimes what God will do, he'll select a person and say, I choose you. And, you, and watch this. And you, your parents may, may have accidentally accidentally conceived you but it was no accident to God because God intended for you to be here with that DNA watch this that sperm that egg God chose you he sent you and you say well where's my father God says when your father and mother forsake you then I will take you up and God parented you more than you, you're willing to give him credit for number one I gotta grieve what it was number two I gotta grieve what it meant number three I gotta grieve that it's gone and that's where we struggle. Got to agree that it's gone. And that's where I wrestle. I got up and I was walking through the house. I was, I was thinking to myself, what is the world going to be like without him? I'm, and I'm going to tell you what I found myself doing. I refused to engage it as a son. So you know what I did? What I always do. When, when my human self can't handle the situation, I become my pastoral self. See, because pastor doesn't have to heal. I have to heal or feel. All pastor has to do is minister. All pastor, right? And the Lord says to me, as we, we're making arrangements, the Lord said to me, um, I was going to volunteer to do the eulogy, and the Lord says, no, you're going to, you're going to grieve him as a son, not as a pastor. That's, that's new to me because now I have to sit there. I'm not the one giving counsel, quoting scripture, telling you what I've learned. No, I'm, I'm going to be the one. And I'm gonna t I have to sit with it and let the waves wash over me. Before my, before my, my father passed, I had, I had a prophetic dream. In the dream, I was sitting like in the bleachers. And we, for whatever reason, we were watching the ocean. Sitting here watching the ocean, and this wave came in like a tsunami, and I braced myself, and the wave just went over me and crashed. And I said to myself, what in the world? Here comes another one. So I held my breath. I, I said, when it passes over me, then I just I'll endure it. It'll fall on me, then I'll, I'll come up for air. It, again, it went over me, and it crashed. This time I got up, and I said, I'm leaving. And I, and I got out of there real quickly. And the third wave came in, and I, ha I happened to outrun it, and I woke up, and I'm like, what in the world was this? And the Lord says, there's going to be two major occurrences. This was Monday. There are going to be two major occurrences. The first one, you won't see coming. The second one, you're going to see it coming, and you're going to brace yourself, and it's going to totally go past you. And so when that happened, I went, I paid attention. I went, okay, let's, let's, this dream, what, let me see, what, what was I doing where I, and the Lord says, don't, don't try to do nothing. He said, you're going to see it and you're going you're to hold your breath. You're going to brace it and it's just going to go past you and you're going to be okay. When you're a prophetic person, you grieve prophetically. You really do. What it means is, is that God is going to show you things to come. When they come, they're going to happen. And it doesn't mean because you saw it, well, I saw it, I knew that already. It doesn't mean you won't have to grieve it. You won't have to grieve what it was, what it meant, and that it's done or it's gone. You have, you, and you have to come to terms. Okay, so, so the relationship was good until it wasn't. Right? And because you got so hurt, you don't want to grieve what it was. I knew there was something about her. And no, that's not true. That's not true. You loved her. She was your girlfriend. She was, she was your best friend. Y'all did life together. You miss her. You grieve what it was. What did it mean? I had someone who could see me. I could share everything with. What, now I grieve that it's gone. And you're going to ask questions like, what am I going to do? You're going to survive. You're going to live. You're going to get through this. You're going to cry, and you're going to do what normal people do. You're going to get through this, okay? Grief enables you to fully let go. It's the only way the soul knows to let go. So you're going to, you're going to cry. You're going to find it. It's going to happen in waves. You're going to wake up crying. You're going to walk around. You're going to break down. And you let yourself just feel it. In the old Pentecostal church, you know what they taught us, Reginique? They told us um, that grief was of the devil. It was a spirit and you did cast it out. So I went the first 20 years of my Christian experience not grieving anything. 
But what I found was I would get angry. When people would leave or when I lose friends, I get angry at them. I get so hostile at them that I have to get delivered from bitterness. That stopped when I started grieving. That stopped when I didn't have to be angry at people for leaving my life. All I do now is I, 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 I grieve what it was. I grieve what it meant. I grieve that it's gone. And then my heart begins to let go. Grief frees you from anything that's, re- that's remaining a tie or, or, or anything, any connection. It frees you from that. It clears your mind and it helps to heal your injuries. And they don't heal overnight. Are you all hearing me? Yeah. Listen to me. I'm, I believe I'm here sharing this at this particular time because I'm not the only person in the room grieving. I'm not the only person. We're grieving different things, but we're grieving. Watch this now. Grief cannot be rushed. It must be thorough. It must be honest. You got to be honest with this. Some of you are in a marriage right now. Singing that Gladys Knight song. Neither one of us wants to be the first. But you know, you know what it, where it, it's all, you know it. Right? And here's why, because the Bible says that when you get to that place, it's hardness of heart. You close your heart to one another. Once you close your heart to one another, life stopped flowing between you. It didn't die, you killed it. Right? So you, you, got to, you, can't, you have to be honest in your grief. Grief must finish its work before you're ready to move on and fully commit to what's next. God will not release what's next to you until you grieve what was. Some will say this, and, and then I don't know that there's much more to say. Grief is leftover love. It's leftover love. It's your heart assigning new meaning to the connection. It is, it is, it is living with someone or something that has finished their course. And I want to say this. It's like the thing died, but you're still alive. And it's still alive in you. The person died, but it's still alive in you. That's what you're dealing with, the life of the other person in you. I don't think we honor how fearfully and wonderfully God made us. It's not just that we together hang out. If we spend enough time together, we, we exchange life. And if, if the person is your parent or your child, listen, if, if the person is your parent, they're in you, like literally. Genetically, they're in you. If, 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 the, if the person was your child, you're in them. How can you not? Jacob said this thing felt like an amputation. So God helps us with this grief process. He helps us to process the loss. Yeah. Grief is letting go of what you cannot keep. It requires you accepting both mentally and emotionally that something you loved is no more. It helps you to redirect your energies and your focus so you can, so you can look at and, and concentrate on what you can have and what is good in your life. It, it, it helps you to just say, okay, that's not here, but now I have this. And so if any of my siblings are watching, you know, one of the things that we have to concentrate on is that now that dad is gone, what we have to do is make sure that we got each other. And we got to make sure that, that everybody's good, and that we move forward together. We have to make sure that none of us feel dropped or let go or, or left out. We got to make sure. We gotta make, why? Because, because there was, there's something now missing. And one of the things that Pastor Benita prayed that was powerful is that spirits of, of, of strife attack Whenever, whenever there's a loss, spirits of strife come in, they want you fighting and hating and blaming. The spirit of blame is strong in the arena of grief. In the arena of grief, if you grieve without, if you grieve without hope, if you don't understand what grief is, you find yourself angry at people. It's because of you. It's because, and we start blaming one another. And that's not the will of God for us. So, um, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you and then we'll be done. Matter of fact, no, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for allowing me to come and um, talk to you today. I, I didn't... Um, my intention was not to come to preach. I always know when I have a word from the Lord. And I think today the world was for me. But I want to ask you a question. How many of you here today are in some way or in some shape grieving some loss? Let me see your hand. Just a show of hands real quickly. Okay. 
Can I offer this real fast? Pain is, is, is to live in pain is a very difficult thing. Um, I never have a problem doing what I do. It's, it comes like second nature. Just, I mean, if you let me, I'll preach four hours and not bad an eye. But when, when, when it's grief involved, you start to question everything. And so what I want to pray for you, the people that raise their hand, and, and I sense that hands need to be laid, but I know that I, I need to lay the hands. Yes, I do. do let's do this real quickly. The, the people who raise your hand, if you, and I'm not going to push you to do this, and this is totally up to you because I know grief is so personal. And sometimes it's, we, we, it, it embarrasses us because our vulnerability surprises us to know that we're not Invincible sometimes is a surprise. You know, I was in a conversation with my son this morning, and I was talking to him. He was checking on me, and I'm being strong on the phone, and I just broke down and started crying. And I'm like, and I'm, I said, wait a minute. I put the phone down. I'm like, get yourself together. I'm talking to myself. Get it together. And I put the phone up, and it started again, and, and I have to hold the phone until I'm good, and then I come back talking to him because there's a need to present ourselves as whole. When you lose something or someone that close to you, you're not whole. No. So do this for me. Oh, everyone's standing together. Everyone's standing together. Father, I thank you, Lord, that, th that there's an anointing to heal, but at least to begin the process, an anointing for acceptance. For if, if you're watching by stream, I, I want to encourage you, if you are in a grief process, if you've suffered a loss within the last year or so, or, or maybe two years and you still haven't dealt with it, this is the time to do it. I don't know why today was a day that God would have me to do this, but I believe some people need to be freed. The people who raise their hand, you say, Pastor, I need, I, I, I need prayer. If you do, you, if you say, I can't leave here without somebody, come, come real quick, come, come. come. The sister in the middle in the flower dress, you, I need you to come. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't think you're going to disrupt your healing by acknowledging that you're grieving, that you suffered loss. You said, Pastor, I, listen, trying to forget it is not healing. Denying it is not healing. Lord God is the whole building. For real. Okay. Come, come on down. You're, you're a bunch of them. First, I want to say, whatever you lost, I'm sorry for your loss. I don't think you're here by accident. I don't think that you came today just because. For those of you who are in the difficult space that you're still living in the thing you're losing, listen to what I just said. You're still living in the thing you're losing. In other words, the loss is happening gradually, and you just wish it would just happen already and be done with, but it's slow in the process. For those of you, I'm going to say you have got to trust God extraordinarily. What you're going to have to do in this situation is that you have to say to the Lord, you know what, I need, I'm, I already start grieving it. Give me direction. You need wisdom. You, everybody say, I need wisdom. There, there's a wisdom that comes with grieving properly. I got to know how to move and what to do. And, and sometimes, watch this, sometimes you're going to have to let go of the thing before it let go of you. Because there's nothing like hanging on to a dead thing. You know, you know it's dead, but you just, you just can't bring yourself. You say, I just. And if you're the one that has closed your heart, then I'm going to tell you what has to happen. If you close your heart in a situation where your heart is necessary for the thing to live, then you got to open your heart. Got to open your heart. Let the, Lord, let the Lord do what he's going to do. Let the Lord do what he's going to do. The Lord never called his people to be inhuman. He never called us and told us that we have to, to prove faith we can't cry. To prove faith we can't feel. To prove faith we can't hurt. 
And some of us, we're grieving different things. Some of you say, Pastor, I got a diagnosis. I'm grieving my health. I'm, I'm grieving my mom. I'm grieving my dad. I'm grieving the job. I'm grieving the business. I'm grieving my relationship. They won't return the call. They ghost me. You, you're grieving that, and it's okay. But can I ask you to get God involved in the process? I need all the, all the elders, everyone that's going to minister, we're going to minister to the people who are going to put oil on their heads. And I'm going to tell you, that now some of this is going to be real violent. I, excuse my expression, but we're going to be kind of violent. We're, going, we, we're not going to come and just touch you. Because what the enemy has been trying to do to you is box you into a situation that you can't get out of. And when I leave here, I promise you, when I leave here today, at some point, I feel it. I feel, I feel that, that, that the whales, because let me explain something. It was Dr. Hope. You see, what you don't know about today is... I, I, I text Dr. Hope, and here's what I said to her. I was numb. It's, I, I couldn't feel anything, and, and I knew it was wrong. It, you, I, my whole, when, I, when I heard the news, I just went numb. I couldn't feel a thing. And then you start to guilt yourself because you, why am I not crying? Why am I not wailing? Why, and you're numb. Has anybody here experienced the numbness of loss? Yeah, the enemy, what the enemy is trying to do, first of all, it's, it's very, very natural to be numb. There's something on the inside of you that's in denial, okay? So what, so what you do is, and I'll tell you what I do. You, you have to sit with the situation, and you have to initiate. You have to, like, what was it? What did it mean? Now that it's gone, what did I do? And you live with this. You start, because it's real, you have to go through it. You have to purge yourself of this. And when it starts, you may have to, you may have to call someone and say, come sit with me. You may, have to, you may have to sit with a therapist and, and talk it through. You may have to sit, talk, speak to an elder or, or one, a prophet or someone and walk through this situation. Because we need you whole. We need you here. We need you strong. Okay? But sometimes before there's strength, there has to be weakness. Everybody lifting your hands. We're going to pray for us. I want all those of you who are going to minister. And if, you, if, one, if any of my leaders are suffering with this, listen, I'll get in the line. Let's, let's, we're going to, we're, we're, we minister to you too. Bring, bring the oil real quick. Lift your hands to the Lord. Now, now here's what I want you to do. Don't just lift your, your hands in hopes or looking forward to hands being laid on you. Lift your hands before the Lord, the one who loves you. There's a scripture I posted this week. It says, because of your great love, I will come into your house. I come to, why did I come to worship? Because I know you love me. The apostle John wrote in his epistle, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Another place it says we love him because he first loved us. So what are we doing right now? Right now we are, we are leading into his love. We're leading into his love. You have, listen, no one can love you like God loves you. Put all on everybody's hands. I need all my ministry, all the people, get, let's get ministry happening. Yeah. Lift your hands to God. Lift your hands to Yeah. Yes. Let him cry. Matter of fact, I speak over your life right now. I declare in Jesus' name that no longer can you bottle up and hold back. I release you to weep. I release you to release. To be relieved of the pain. I release you to feel comfortable enough in the house of the Lord to release yourself and cry. I release you to be vulnerable. In this, in this moment, you're in a safe space. You're in a safe space. It is, it is okay to weep. It is okay to let it out and say, I, 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 God, help me. It's okay in this space. You, you're grieving the, the divorce that cost you your children. You're grieving the house. that you grieve it all. Let it, This is the place right here. The Lord is among us and the Lord will see to it. That when you come out of this grief, you, he will release you to your next place. And something powerful and something effective. I, I speak wisdom over you. The kind of wisdom that will show you what is God and what is not. What is wrong and what is right. What is yes and what is no. What is next and what is now. God is going to teach you. He's going to show you. Come.